we are here today with uh, Shirley Stone, who is the curator of the uh, photographic retrospective of the American Indian Movement. Uh, of course, the photographer is uh, Richard Bancroft, and of course, uh, Shirley Stone, amongst other work that she does, of course, is the curator of this very important photo exhibit. Shirley, would you tell us a little bit about your work and how you conceived this idea? Yes, um, I work with the American Indian Neighborhood Development Corporation, which is a 30-year-old organization in uh, the Phillips neighborhood down here on Franklin Avenue. The American Indian Neighborhood Development Corporation uh, has developed eight blocks of Franklin Avenue. Uh, we have created 500 jobs and we have 47 businesses. One of the ways we've tried to attract business is through American Indian art. American Indian art is the number one request of visitors to the Twin Cities area, according to the Greater Minneapolis and Convention Visitors Association. Um, so we've been able to renovate this whole neighborhood, and art has been one tool. Uh, the exhibit that I'm going to show you now is a very exciting uh, exhibit, and it's a very important exhibit. And uh, I just want to tell you that it has had about 4,000 visitors to the exhibit, and there have been people from 22 different states in the country, so half of the United States has seen the exhibit, and nine foreign countries. So it's been a very popular exhibit. And the reason it was important to do, this is the hub. It is the largest urban Indian population in the United States. A lot of people don't realize that probably nearly 70% of American Indian people live in the city at some point now. And this is where it all started. It was the largest concentration again of urban Indian population. And the American Indian movement started right in this community. And it was the start for most of the major urban American Indian organizations. Uh, we have uh, many generations of Indian people living in this neighborhood and probably 70 some different tribes represented. But the reason it's important to show this exhibit of the movement, the movement was probably the mo one of the most important civil rights movements of America's history. And it gave voice to American Indian people and it really gave voice to the sovereignty that tribes have. But we have about probably three generations here now that did not live during the time of the movement. And we have to show them what happened. And some of the leaders of the movement live in this community. And it was very important to pass the story on because their lives and maybe even the schools they go today were greatly affected by leaders such as Vernon and Clyde and others here. So it's passing on the story and the importance of the American Indian Movement. And that's why I wanted to do it for our people but also for the broader community and needs for the to future. be educated. And for the future. It's uh -huh. the first curated work of art of the American Indian Movement. So with that, let's go in and see the show. Well, let's do that, Shirley. <laughs> let's go see the show. Okay. In the and here we are in the gallery, and my very special guest, of course, is Dick Bancroft, who is a photographer, uh, which you're all going to be able to see this uh, tremendous photo exhibit. Welcome, Dick. Thanks, Vernon. Uh, Vernon is a problem for me because he's the guy that got me involved back in 1970. And I started shooting pictures of the Indian struggle in the urban area of Minneapolis and St. Paul back in the 70s. And uh, what you're going to see here today is some posters and mainly a bunch of photographs of the early days of the American Indian movement. This poster, Vernon, tell me about this poster because this has really historical. Well, the topic of this poster is the Red Man's Great International Warrior Society. And this was painted, and this is the original incidentally, by a very prominent leader of the Cognawaga Mohawk in Canada, uh, Louis Hall. And this uh, was presented to my brother, Nigan Wewewidan, or Clyde Belcourt, most people would know him as, in 1973. And uh, it's very descriptive of uh, the struggle at that time and was captured in oils by Louis Hall. A great photo. 
Well, let's move over here and look at some of these pictures, Vernon. We're going to have a hard time. This, this photograph that was used in a poster back in 1981 in New York, and now uh, it's been chosen to be the poster picture for this show. It's actually, uh, you know these guys, this is a photograph taken at the longest walk with uh, uh, Tom LeBlanc and his brother, and uh, yeah, Stacy LeBlanc and the, who's the man guy in, in the middle? middle is John Bluebird. All right, they're they're out in front of the FBI building uh, in one of the days during the longest walk in Washington D.C. and they're looking up in the windows. They're standing on top of a van, which was in 1978. Yep. Now this this picture here shows Clyde and Bill Means and Bill Wapapa and Greg Zephyr, both of whom have died. Uh, entering the UN building under, uh, under the auspices of the International Indian Treaty Council back in 1977. And this, this was at the United Nations in, uh, in Geneva, Switzerland. It was during the time that they were drafting international declarations for the defense of indigenous people, which after all these years is an ongoing program. This is uh, the uh, a group of long walkers on the longest walk in 1978 walking from California to Washington DC entering Washington DC and the park police are there in force greeting them significant thing is that none of the Indian people in that parade in that march are looking at the police and of course that was the continuation of the drafting of the international declaration uh, for the defense of indigenous people this is the during the longest walk in 1970 uh, 70, let's see, that was 1978 also. The placement of the teepee on the south lawn right near the Washington Monument. This teepee is from the Heart of the Earth Survival School in Minneapolis. Jimmy Carter was president. He came out on the south portico, wondered what was going on, and then he went over to, to Germany and chastised the Russians for their human rights violations. This is, I took this from the 40th floor of a motel in White Sulphur Springs, a suburb of Washington, and it, it was hard to get permission to get up on top of that building, but finally I convinced them that a whole bunch of Indians were coming down the avenue, and he, the manager of the motel, allowed me to go up and shoot that picture. Of course, there were several thousands of us from all tribes across the country, both in the urban and reservation communities who were part of the longest walk of 1978. These posters are inserted in the, in the show to give it uh, a different dimension, and this particular one is important because it was the symbol of the American Indian Movement. The artist who did this is unknown. No, it's Steve Blake, and uh, no, no. who did most of, our, uh, uh, most of our graphics that you see here, if not this one, was done by Steve Blake. Yeah, okay. Now, uh, during the the Trail of Broken Treaties in 1972, uh, President Nixon was, it was in November, he was waiting to be reelected. And these, these uh, four gentlemen are in front of the BIA building. This is after the takeover of the building. The flag upside down indicates distress. Weapons were made to defend themselves from reinforcing uh, rods and the building. And as I recall, of course, that's Gene Heavy Runner, and I believe he's from uh, the Assiniboine of Montana, and of course, uh, Bo Little, uh, who is from the Ogallala Lakota Nation at a place called Pine Ridge. This is Elsie Gibbons with a face that will launch a thousand ships. Uh, Elsie has gone to the spirit world, and actually I took this picture in San Francisco at a conference in 1982. Now, going backward here, these are two photographs in front of the courthouse in Minneapolis, where uh, Indian women are beating on a purse after they've been busted at the Naval Air Station takeover in 1971. And Peggy Bellacourt and Pat Ballinger are in these two pictures. Uh, they, uh, it was my first experience with a bust, and it was very distressing to me to see how the federal marshals treated Indian people, particularly the women and children. And of course, that was one of the first uh, demonstrations when we embarked on a policy of confrontational politics. And that, in fact, brought uh, nationwide and worldwide attention to the fact that 
Indian people were still here. This young lady is exhausted after the longest walk. She's sitting in front of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. I didn't know her identity for 15 years because her face is not evident, but she is an Ogallala Lakota woman from Pine Ridge. Mm -hmm. And, oh, Vernon shows up here. This is in front of the Capitol building in Washington uh, during the longest walk. This photo is kind of interesting because Ted Kennedy came down during uh, the festivities around the longest walk, and he is trying to convince Clyde and Russell Means that uh, he has legislation that will be favorable to Indians. And when Russell recites the fact that it isn't favorable, uh, it throws Kennedy into con uh, confusion, and he's rustling through his documents. And of course, uh, Russell Means came late in 1970 and left early as he resigned in 1973. And of course, this is a much younger, but not so lean, Vernon Belcourt. <laughs> now, this is in the picket line in front of the BIA building with Dennis telling everybody over a loudspeaker what they should do. Bill Means is in the picture who lives in Minneapolis. And uh, Herb, Herb Paulus. Paulus and others waiting for the assault, which never happened, but fortunately, but that's what they're doing. They're, they're ready to defend the BIA building. This is a poster that, that hung in the same Minneapolis office right across the street over here, the Bureau of Catholic Charities, a, a poster for, uh, in support of Leonard Peltier in the Peltier office that people signed over and over again. I, uh, I've signed it somewhere here, but this was hanging up in that office all during the early 80s. And we've framed it up and put it in the show to show the the people who supported Leonard. And of course, we'll be talking about Leonard Peltier a little later, but unfortunately, regrettably, is a political prisoner that is still in prison after 30 years. And we continue to work to free Leonard Peltier. This is a photograph taken down in Arizona, Santa Rosa, Arizona, with the Oatom people. Uh, we had a conference down there of the International Indian Treaty Council, and uh, that's the security uh, for that particular meeting. This young man, uh, Amity Buffalo, was a resident of Yellow Thunder Camp in South Dakota for several years. This is back in the early 80s as well, and he now is six foot, at that time he was eight years old, he's now six foot four, and a handsome young man living in Oregon. Great photos. Yeah. Well, he's a great kid too. Mm -hmm. This is another poster that's in the show. I don't know who the artist was, and it was, as it says, 1978 for AIM, but I like having these posters in the show. It breaks up the steady dose of photographs, and I actually have been collecting posters ever since I began photographing Native people. I began to collect posters that went along with it, and that's what you're seeing in the show. You got one of the largest collections uh, yeah. in uh, in the movement. Well, it's a terrific collection, and yeah. it brings back a lot of memories. This is an interesting shot because it, it's in the Black Hills, and uh, the lead in this march from Rapid City out into the hills was the American Indian Movement here. But these were also a bunch of non-Indian environmentalists that were following along behind, and they had a big conference in 1979. Refresh my memory, Dick. Wasn't, wasn't this a march up the Keystone to, the, uh, uh, to what they call the Rushmore Monument? No, we didn't go to the Rushmore Monument. Oh, you didn't? Here. I thought that's where that was going. Where was this march going? Well, we went into the Black Hills where they had a, an environmental conference uh -huh. uh, okay. in late summer. Yeah, it looks like there's several hundred, if not a few thousand oh, there. Yeah, a lot of people. This is Philip Deere and his wife, Edna. Uh, taken at one of the conferences, and this is Yellow Thunder Camp, Vernon, where mm -hmm. uh, Indian people lived here for maybe three or four years, including uh, the Buffalo Kid and the Buffalo family and Sherry Means and others. Many people lived here. This was an effort to recover and reclaim the eight, sacred eight, Paha Sapa. Yeah, the 800, Black Hills. 800 acres were Surely. symbolically taken. And I could say Philip Deere is a very prominent uh, spiritual leader of the Muscogee Creek Wind Clan. And of course, unfortunately, uh, so many of our leaders have passed on into the spirit world. So did Philip Deere. It was a great loss to everybody. He was a great man. 
Now, this is just a TP shot at one of the conferences, putting up the TP, which the symbol of, instead of saying it, staying at a Holiday Inn, when we go to these conferences out in the countryside, we put up the teepees. Sure. And this is at Yellow Thunder Camp with a motorcycle and a young man living at Yellow Thunder Camp in a teepee. Quite a contrast. Uh, oh, this is Pat Sheppel, who currently is residing in Minneapolis. Uh, this is at the Black Hills, and she's putting up her tent. This is the cook tent uh, for Yellow Thunder Camp. And uh, I went out there each of the four seasons to photograph the people that lived there. This was a really a, a very significant struggle. Of course, this uh, poster is a very important poster. Uh, in 1974, we held the first International Indian Treaty Conference up on the Standing Rock nation in North and South Dakota, and present was a Dean of Ethnology and Anthropology of Paris University, Robert Jolan, who was a very prominent uh, educator in France, and of course he's passed on also, but he invited us over to the uh, Gallery Doyle, uh, the Rue de Sablier in Paris, the Gallery Doyle on the Rue de Sablier in Paris, and of course this is uh, with the participation of Dennis Banks. And uh, I believe this uh, outline is Crowfoot, a very prominent Blackfeet leader from Canada. But I think it's, uh, it's, very, it's a very nicely done poster. Yeah, yeah. Okay, these are elders from, from Pine Ridge that came to support Dennis and Russell when they were on trial in St. Paul in 1974, I believe. They, uh, that was the Wounded Knee trial for the leadership of the, of the uh, takeover of Wounded Knee. And down here, can you imagine what the jury and the spectators in the courtroom thought when these distinguished ladies showed up in the court, courtroom? This is Dennis Banks and Bill Kunstler and Stokely Carmichael. Kwame Torre. Yeah, Kwame Torre now. Uh, Bill Kunstler was the lead defense lawyer for the trial that was taking place in St. Paul, Minnesota. And this was taken one evening after we would gather in the evening and discuss what was going to happen the next day and what had happened the day before. This was at the All American Indian Movement offices in St. Paul, Minnesota. Yeah. And of course, regrettably again, Kwame Ture has passed on into the spirit world, as is Bill Kunstler. Uh, great loss uh, to uh, their movement and of course to our movement. This, is, this poster is from my garage, but it also uh, signifies a, a, an event when for two weeks uh, a group of people listed here, including Winona LaDuke and, and uh, the, uh, the other, uh, there was a delegation of Indians that I went along to photograph to talk about uh, nuclear free future cities in Germany in 19. I think it was 19, what's, what's the date on that? 19, well, it doesn't say. Oh, 83. 1983. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is probably a very significant photograph because it shows five pipe carriers entering the, entering the UN building. And all five of these people have, have gone to the spirit world. They are Heathrow, Philip Deere, David Menangi, Chief Shannon Doa from upstate New the York. Tata Daho, head chief of the Iroquois. Yeah. And uh, this is Larry Redshirt. A descendant of a famous warrior Redshirt who served at the Battle of the Bighorn. And normally the UN wouldn't allow people like this to walk in in that regalia with pipes. But they insisted on doing it and they did it. And it's been on the cover of a couple of books in, uh, put out by Akwesasne. And uh, I... If uh, I could just comment a little yeah. bit more. You know, a lot of people only hear about the so-called leaders of the American Indian Movement, but the message that we want to put out is these are the real leaders of the American Indian Movement, the elders, prominent, uh, very respected leaders of many different nations. And of course, uh, again, as you said, they're all gone. A great loss. This is down in, in uh, Arizona again at our treaty conference, and there was an arbor set up with a parachute over it, and a dust storm came along and blew the, the parachute down, and uh, they just wrapped it around the center pole, and it took on an eerie quality. Very, very warm country down there. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the same poster that 
we saw when we walked in here. Uh, but this one is signed by, to me, by a, a group of people. I don't think Vernon signed it, though. Did you sign it? Right down there on the bottom. Oh, is that you? My end name, of course, is Wabanini. That's why I didn't uh, recognize My missionary you. name is Vernon Belcourt. I want to make that clear. This young lady is, uh, this picture has gotten a lot of attention because she's obviously weeping and she's listening to the testimony uh, by people in, a, in the Russell Tribunal about the sterilization of Indian women. And I turned, I was photographing the people talking and I turned around and half the room was in tears. Uh, this is Clyde and Pat Ballinger uh, at the UN in 1977. And uh, this Clyde, you don't recognize him there because he's got a mustache, but uh, these people were very prominent in testifying on the Indians of the Americas and the land. And then we move on. This is up in a, a hot issue right now, the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, where the caribou drop their calves. And we had a conference up there above the Arctic Circle in a, in a town called Arctic Village. And these are the delegates from the International Indian Treaty Council that attended that conference. This is after the Geneva Conference in 1977. And Ver Clyde told me then, he told these people to, to assemble for the traditional group picture. And he said, if everybody who gets in the picture wants a copy, the bald-headed guy will make sure <laughs> he'll get it. Uh -huh. Well, that's great. This is a particularly distressing and sad part of the show because it represents four visits that I made as a journalist uh, to visit with Leonard Peltier in three different penal institutions. Leonard's been in prison now for, he's in his 30th year for a crime he did not commit. And even the FBI, which falsely accused him of killing two FBI agents in 1974, 75, uh, he uh, it's been proven now that he did not fire the weapon that killed the two agents. But they keep him in jail because the FBI needs to have some Indian serve time for the loss of two men. Nobody prosecuted anybody for the loss of uh, Joe Stunts, who was killed in the shootout that occurred at Grandma Jumping Bulls in those days. I was not at the shootout, but I have visited Leonard four different times. And this, these pictures are in sequence of the visits, showing his aging process. Uh, it's uh, really distressing to me to go into a prison to visit Leonard, but when I see him, when I sit with him and photograph him, I am lifted by his spirit. To, and I walk out of there uh, you know, invigorated by this brave and noble person who knows who did the shooting and is not talking about it, uh, but he serves the time for it. And the FBI says uh, that he was complicit, therefore he must serve uh, two life terms. Uh, he, he possibly could have been pardoned by Clinton when Clinton left office, President Clinton left office, but Clinton had other things on his agenda. You'll see here that this man is, is really clean and I remember visiting him the last time in 2000. Uh, I said to him as he hugged me, you smell so good, Leonard. And he laughed because he had been prepared for our visit. I was with a German press person in these two visits and with Mordecai Spector from, Saint, from Minneapolis. Mordecai Spector is the editor of the Jewish World. He, he got us in the first two times. Now. Leonard is unavailable. We cannot get into prison to visit him because the government has chosen to make it difficult for outside interests to see this guy and to get his story. Amnesty International uh, has listed him as a political prisoner in the United States. One thing I would point out, he was never charged with first degree murder. Uh, he was charged under these catch-all charges of a conspiracy. So they never proved that Leonard Peltier was actually the shooter. No, no. That was a trumped up uh, framing of, in every sense of the word, of this, of this young warrior. Yeah, the FBI faked 
the ballistics exactly. report and said that his gun killed the agents when now they admit that it wasn't his gun. So we've got this contradiction going on with the FBI and the FBI has been playing games with the American Indian movement ever since its inception. Well, the war goes on. And meanwhile, back in, in, in Pine Ridge, these are the, the list of the people that were killed in various shootouts and drive-by shootings, Indian people whose loss of life was never uh, considered by the government, the federal government, and nobody was ever prosecuted for the loss of all these people, just the two agents. Uh, that, that's the, another part of the tragedy, is how Indian people on the reservations, particularly Pine Ridge, have been abused for, by federal authorities for a long, long time. And of course, the Indian wars are not over. Free Leonard Peltier. That's it. One of the, the really fun things, Vernon, that I, that I did during the early 70s and later on even, was to photograph the kids in the survival schools, which were popping up all over the place. And this was taken at the Red Schoolhouse in St. Paul. And this is the Heart of the Earth Survival School in Minneapolis. Actually, it wasn't in the current structure that it's in at the university. It was in a, an abandoned house in, in South Minneapolis. Now, again, a poster that uh, <coughs> Steve Blake did, uh, you've heard him mention before, but every time there was an, a conference or a meeting or something going on, the poster was the way to publicize it. And the poster art was really one of the best was Steve Blake, who's now uh, quite ill, but still around. And I, <coughs> I saved these as we went along. Really? Again, the, uh, the, the kids in the school uh, at Red Schoolhouse in St. Paul, and this is at the Red Schoolhouse in St. Paul, which is no longer operating, but this is recess. And one, it's one of my favorite pictures because it's a quite a different recess than you get uh, in the white dominated schools with the drum and the kids going around the drum. <coughs> These are some friends of mine up in upstate New York, uh, Jose Barrio's kids and uh, Gudgy Cook's kids. Uh, up, up, uh, oh, this is outside of where Cornell University is. Mm -hmm. Vernon, this is uh, one of three uh, exhibits of memorabilia from the movement, including a lot of buttons and a silkscreen shirt and the silkscreen uh, model. And, but the feature of this cubicle was the article in 1973 Penthouse Magazine in which you're featured. And I'd like to have you comment. I, I oftentimes, uh, you know, think that Penthouse Magazine is not the right place for you to be. But on the other hand, this is a very flattering article about you. And uh, could you comment about that article? Well, of course, uh, I was uh, doing the Today Show with Barbara Walters very early on in 1973 in New York City. And a writer for Penthouse Magazine approached and said they wanted to do an interview. So I was very flattered, of course, to be the principal interview in the 1973 July issue of Penthouse, which I was walking through Paris, uh, spreading the word of our struggle, and I went to a, a gazebo newsstand and I thumbed through Penthouse, and, uh, and there, lo and behold, was my picture. And when I read the caption that I was the most militant Indian since Geronimo, of course, I was very flattered and very honored, and I have since then that the notoriety uh, certainly out, outseeds the, uh, the reality. And uh, of course, uh, again, we were able to get our, our message out uh, throughout the world because obviously it was a very important magazine to have this article in. Well, this is one of the issues that wasn't prominent then, the one that you carry today, is the nickname issue. We haven't mentioned that today. And uh, if, if this article was redone, that would be a major a major part of the article because Vernon is one of the leaders, is the leader of the anti-nickname issue facing uh, athletic teams throughout the country. Sure, as president of the National Coalition on Racism in Sports and Media, uh, we have brought about the national and worldwide attention 
uh, that we are human beings. Uh, we are not mascots for America's fun and games. We're a living people with a living culture, and we hope that people would respect that and not have our culture put on display for American sports. That's very offensive to our people. Let's go to another cubicle, Vernon. Vernon, uh, in this cubicle, that's what I call these blocks, but uh, the, the bumper stickers are very evident here, plus the AIM pins and all the powwow pins, all the memorabilia that goes into the movement today uh, in modern times, and it goes way back, some of this stuff. Uh, there's a beadwork AIM pin there, and on the other side is a, is a bandana. This is a silkscreen uh, used to make t-shirts, the imprint on t-shirts. So all of that hard stuff uh, was floating around and I collected it just like I did the posters as I went about my way. You see anything in there? Oh, there's the Wounded Knee anniversary, 25th anniversary stick uh, patch that uh, was put out in 19, uh, what was it, 98? 73. Uh... Well, it was put out much later, of course. Yeah, yeah. 98. Yeah. This, that is 25 years mm -hmm. after the Wounded Knee takeover of 73. Anyway, that's... And I think I see a solidarity statement from the Haudenosaunee, which is the, the traditional name of the great Iroquois nation, the six nations of the Iroquois. I've watched a lot of people look at this, these cubicles, and uh, it's kind of interesting because they don't see this stuff all in one place very exactly. often. Yeah. Oh, here's another one. Now move over here. In, in this cubicle, Vernon, we see uh, one of the t-shirts done by, by that stencil over there, the silk screen, rather. <clears throat> and then two important items that appear at all gatherings of Native people. One of them is the sage smudge with, uh, that is used for prayers and a sweetgrass a wand that is burned also in sweat lodges and other uh, gatherings. Can, can you tell me a little bit about Albert Downwind? Yeah, Alberta Downwind uh, was one of the original organizers and leaders of the American Indian Movement in 1968. And during the first organizing meeting on the north side of Minneapolis, uh, uh, they spent some time on what to call this movement. And somebody said, well, you're, we're concerned American Indians so, or concerned Indian Americans, why don't we call it the CIA? And of course people said, no, we can't do that. Uh, uh, and this woman stood up and said, well, I've been hearing you talk about your aims and your goals. Uh, why don't you call it AIM? And so in reality, Alberta Downman uh, created the name for this movement, AIM because of the aims and goals that we had intended to carry out, which we have. And of course, from there, it became known as American Indian Movement. And of course, as I travel worldwide, people will ask me, well, why do you call yourselves American Indian Movement when America seems to have been your problem for hundreds of years? And I will always explain to them that the name was AIM, and from there it evolved around to American Indian Movement. This is one of my favorite photographs, Vernon, because one, you're not in it, but two, <laughs> these are what I call the three terrorists. Now these are Dennis Banks on the left, Eddie Benton, Benet, and Clyde, who were all in Stillwater together in the, in the late 60s. And they are three of the founders, three of about seven or eight founders of the American Indian Movement in a very happy time. And I refer to it as the three terrorists because uh -huh. AIM was, a t was marked as a terrorist organization by the federal government of the United States. But I love that picture because they're all upbeat, and this is taken over at the Indian Center in Minneapolis. You know, I'm not surprised that they would call us that, the government of the United States, because our great leaders who fought to protect our lands and our resources were referred to as savages and yeah. hostile. So the rhetoric of genocide continues. <laughs> That's a good point. Now, this is just Clyde again with a Peltier t-shirt on, and uh, this was taken in Geneva back in 70, 77. Clyde in his younger years, his lighter years. His leaner years. Leaner years, yes. 
Uh, this is uh, Jim Simmons, Jimbo, who uh, this was taken out in Wakpala in 1977 on the top, and an Indian car, I just refer to this as an AIM car. Uh, bumper stickers are very important along with posters for conveying the information. My favorite bumper sticker, which is not in this picture, is Custer wore an arrow shirt. Yes, and the other one, of course, is aim for sovereignty. Yes. Uh, we brought up the issue of sovereignty before most of our leaders even knew how to spell the word or understood what it meant. This de depicts for me one of the, a sad picture in a way because Chief John Flad uh, was up in Grand Portage, Minnesota, and I went into his house with Billy Blackwell to visit him one day, and he opened a drawer in this humble abode of his, and in the drawer was one of the peace medals. And John uh, is, of course, gone to the spirit world now, but he, he was uh, no longer chiefly. He didn't have the, 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 the presence that uh, chiefs of the earlier days had, but a, a good guy, nevertheless. Uh, two other people. Oh, I got to tell you about, uh, about Mike Ballinger. Mike Ballinger, when this picture was taken in 1977, was about 13 or 14 years old. He's now maybe even younger then, and he's now six foot four, and he lives in Minneapolis. And uh, he, this picture, he loves to come into the gallery just to look at himself, because <laughs> I never gave him a copy. This is uh, Dick Lagarde, who was from White Earth, and was one of White the, Earth Ojibwe. Yeah, mm -hmm. White Earth Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, and he, he was uh, very active in the White Earth Reservation and tragically died about five years ago. Uh, we don't know the cause. Mysterious of it. circumstances. Yeah. He was with, uh, in the custody of the Monoman County Police Department, so that's still being investigated. Now, oh, I gotta tell you about Lame Deer. Uh, John Fire is his English name. Lame Deer was uh, uh, in South Dakota. This was taken in Greengrass, South Dakota in 1971. And I should not have taken this picture because it disturbed him. I didn't ask for permission to take his picture. And he was telling uh, another man a dirty joke at the time. <laughs> and I clicked the camera and he turned and walked away. I just got one frame off. And the other man that I was sitting next to at the time I took the picture uh, really criticized me. He said, you should ask permission of a chief sure. to take his picture. Well, after he died, I sent copies of this to his family, and they were delighted to have it. And so I'm, I'm glad that I took the picture, but I, I'm sorry that I upset him. And to learn more about uh, John Fire or Lame Deer, uh, he is the... Uh a subject of a book called Lame Deer, Seeker of Visions. Yep. And uh, that book can be still found in the bookstores. Now this is an important picture because the, the movement has been criticized for being a, a revolutionary movement. When it's really, as you can see in this picture, the pipe that Eddie Benton is lighting, Billy Blackwell in the background and Vernon on the left. Uh, there's the drum right here in the picture, not in the picture, but right off. This proves that this was a spiritual movement back in 1971 at the takeover of the dam in La Couture, Wisconsin. Winter Dam. Winter Dam. And, but the pipe was evident always, and th that, that proves that you know, the movement is a spiritual movement first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Bill Means in Geneva, again back at the uh, La Couture, the Winter Dam takeover, he's painting on the side of the dam the dam flowage is b behind that picture, Indian Power. And this is a press conference being conducted by uh, Eddie Benton Benet and Clyde and Vernon and so forth. Uh, after we got the attention of the Wisconsin government, they sent, the governor sent representatives down by air to negotiate, renegotiate the conditions of the flooding of eight Indian lakes on Indian property into one big burial lake. sites and uh, wild rice wild rice destroyed. beds which has become known town. as the Chippewa flowage yeah and uh, a town too yes uh, of course the whole community uh, oh. I think it was called old agency or something yeah. but that's Rick St. Germain who, who as a youth uh, painted this uh, and Indian power and he went on to become a very prominent professor yeah. and uh, and a leader of his tribe the Lakuta Ojibwe 
And of course, he's still teaching on some of the major and, campuses. And, and he loves the picture, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, Pat Ballinger, my first teacher in 1970, when I first started um, photographing American Indian Movement. And Pat's still around. She's right next door. This is Philip Deere, uh, who was uh, ex extremely significant uh, throughout his limited time with the movement. He was only around for about 15 years. He took ill, but Philip was the, the, really the major spiritual elder. Great of influence, the great teacher. He, he used to say, well, he, he predicted a lot of things. One of them he predicted was that we would have, we would be paying more for bottled water than we do for gasoline. Exactly. That's where we are, although the gasoline's trying to catch up. And uh, Philip also uh, was extremely supportive of the movement. He said, Aim is a direction, a direction. Now, two other, Dennis back in his early 70s uh, with his famous headband, and this is a marvelous guy, uh, noble red man, Andrew uh, Matthew, Matthew King. King. Ogallala Lakota. Uh, Matthew was, uh, he was the significant elder at the, at the takeover of the, uh, the uh, yeah, the Yellow Thunder Camp, the 800 acres in South Dakota. Mm -hmm. And I took that picture one evening, one afternoon of him out there at Yellow Thunder. He was there all the time. Now, a couple of posters back in 74. This poster was, is important because it documents all of the events around it that occurred throughout the movement. Yellow Thunder Camp, Alcatraz, uh, The Longest Walk. All of that is here. It's a very historical thing particularly involving uh, the summit conference that occurred in San Francisco in 82. Ah, uh, this is a picture. I'm not sure Floyd likes this picture. Floyd Westerman, Floyd Red Crow Westerman, uh, who has become a movie star as well as a, he's a great musician. And he recently had a fantastic recovery because he had a lung transplant yes. and it was successful. For three or four years, he was on oxygen and unable to sing. Now he's back with his guitar in his hands and singing again like he used to when he was younger. But uh, he's been here to see the show and I, I never really got an opinion from him whether he liked this photo. I happened to like it because it was early on. Uh, I've taken many pictures of Floyd. He's a sweet guy. And Dick, uh, people can uh, see Red Crow Westerman in Dances with Wolves and recent movie Hidalgo. And he's done a lot of television series. Uh, he's the international ambassador for the American Indian Movement and the International Indian Treaty Council. And of course, a very accomplished artist, sculptor, musician. Now we're wrapping this up with <clears throat> the backbone of the movement, the women. And in this picture, it's particularly important because four of these women have now gone to the spirit world. And Mary Jane uh, Wilson, who is here, has had a stroke. She's still living in Minneapolis. This is Herb Paulus's wife. Dorothy but, Paulus. Yeah, Dorothy, and then these women here, well, Elsie is over there on the wall, and Janet McLeod. Uh, this is, uh, these two are. Agnes Lamont and Nellie Red Owl. You got it. Nellie Red Owl here and Agnes here. And they've all gone into the spirit world. But this was taken in San Francisco in 19, oh, early 80s, and uh, at a conference and they have been the, the, the backbone of the movement all throughout this. They were not uh, sure. necessarily locked up the way the men were, but they were the, the strength of the movement. And I don't know if you mentioned uh, right here on the end is Yetzi Brew or Janet McLeod. Yeah. Uh, actually a, ver a very important activist, even before the American Indian Movement was born in 1968 right here in Minneapolis. Well, you couldn't push her around. That's right, very powerful woman. Well, Vernon, that's it. Uh, that's the show, the American Indian Movement Retrospective, as you call it. And uh, I, I would like to make a comment to you about how valuable our relationship has been and how helpful you've been in allowing me to do this. Uh, I think that came out during the course of looking at the show. But also I want to express my profound thanks to the, 
to the native people that I've come in contact with over these years, who, many of whom are now uh, grown up and are friends, close friends, and the relationship that I've had with, with uh, your people all, all during these years, 35 years, has enriched my life and made my values, altered my values significantly. And for this, I'm ex extremely grateful. Thank you. Well, I'd like to reflect back. You know, it was Pat Ballinger that, who's still very active in our movement, one of our heads women of the, and a very prominent spokesperson for our movement, first introduced me to you in 1972 during the historic Trail of Broken Treaties. Yeah. And at that time, I, I seen a, a white guy with a camera and who wanted to shoot some pictures. <laughs> and there was one individual, of course, who's no longer with our movement, who uh, didn't think we should have a white guy shooting pictures. And even then, I had the vision to think about the future and that we need to document all of the work that has been ongoing and continues to go after 35 years. A fact is, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul are sort of the center of the American Indian movement yet today. Uh, we operate uh, employment and job training centers, the American Indian OIC. I wish my brother, Nigan Wewebidun, or Clyde Belcourt, is founder, chairman of the board. Uh, Bill Means, who is uh, one of the focuses of this show, a uh, very prominent leader in the International Indian Treaty Council and the American Indian Movement, is head of the state OIC council. We operate alternative survival schools, such as the Heart of the Earth, legal rights uh, services, housing. Uh, we are still involved in very intricately in all aspects of work here in the Indian community. And of course, uh, we specifically want to thank you very much for your photographic retrospective of the American Indian Movement. Without uh, that happening in 1972, none of this would have been left for the future generations. For that, we are extremely grateful, and we thank you very much for your wonderful work. Thank you, Vernon.